Coming up next on American Black Journal, we're gonna talk about efforts to reduce suicide rates among black youth. Plus, a Detroit nonprofit expands its work with homeless young people and a sneak peek at the documentary, Detroit Jazz City. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation, Ally, and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Today, we take on a really tough topic, suicide. September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And over the past few years, we've seen a rise in the number of black boys committing suicide. Plus the pandemic is adding to the risk as young people deal with isolation and depression and other factors. That's why the nonprofit called Encourage Me I'm Young started a campaign called Smash Suicide. I talked with the group's founder, Calvin Mann, along with supporter Stacey Robinson, who lost her teenage brother to suicide. So Calvin, I want to start with you and have you just talk about uh, Encourage Me I'm Young and talk about this dangerous trend that we have seen on the rise uh, with black youth and black male youth in particular, uh, this spike in, uh, in suicides and suicide attempts. Well, I mean, when we, when we get into it, encourage me, I'm young. We, we have been mentoring and doing the things that we need to do to make our young men better, right? So we've been teaching young men to lead, to be productive members of society. And we were re awarded Respect Day and it was 2017 when we discovered that young boys, five to 12 were number one, mm -hmm. right? The more we looked into um, the suicide modality and the, the information, so the various uh, suicide uh, events, you know, the whole nine, the more we looked at it, we realized that what we were doing was effective. Hmm. So um, in that process, I started talking more, just like you and I had the conversation. It's like we had to do something about it. So in launching the children's book, Adventures of Oberon Luther, that gave us a face to apply to um, that age group. Right, which allows us to speak to the parent to tell them um, our method. Right, how can we help? Um, Stacy and I have always, you know, uh, been working together the last couple of years, been talking the whole nine. But we discovered along the way, as we kept going, that it wasn't going away. So my voice got louder. Eventually, I flipped over the whole website. So our whole website is now uh, got the, you know number to call in case of suicide. We do a lot of referrals already. But what was astounding was the the 2000, the study from 1998 to 2018, over 28,000 males, black males had committed suicide. Mm -hmm. That was astounding, right? Mm -hmm. Along with, you know, the 2016 and the different information. And, and in our research, we noticed that there were a number of people in this area that was not informed. Like this was not even on their radar. Yeah. And um, for us, it was an opportunity to say, hey, we're already working in prevention. Let's do more. You yeah. know what I mean? So, um, you know, we started talking. I was in a cohort and we started building this committee. And 
one thing led to another. Got Stacy on the phone. She told me her story. Hmm. Yeah, Stacy, this is such a personal issue for many of us. It is a very, very personal issue uh, for you. Um, talk about what happened with your brother. So my brother um, was 18. He was a senior in high school um, in 1999, actually. And um, my brother, um, uh, long story short, took his life. Um, it kind of was a shock to my entire family. I have all brothers. I have three brothers. Um, once you, I lost two brothers in 99, uh, one to murder and one to suicide. And it was very devastating that, to know that my brother was going through things that I was not aware of. And um, like Calvin, the one thing we do have is the passion of making sure that our kids are okay. Um, after my brother took his life, I discovered that there were, he left signs that he was going through. Because I was not in his household at the time, I didn't see all of them, but they came through later. My mom told me that he wasn't um, bathing himself like he normally would. He wouldn't get out of his room. Um, he was giving away important things to his friends. Um, he was having issues at school. All those were flags. Had I known, I would have interceded. And Calvin, um, the, what Calvin is doing, my mom and I did. We started a, 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 a nonprofit right after my brother passed to talk about it. And so we were going into the Detroit public schools. He, this was happened in the Detroit public school. Mm. The schools didn't want us in. The churches didn't want us in. Nobody wanted to hear about it. And so that's been many years ago. And Calvin has resurrected this same hope. It doesn't stop. Um, it's actually on the rise now, in my opinion, because I work at human services as well. With this pandemic, it's created a major um, burden on our children. Yeah. They don't have the outlets. And for boys, they're physical. They like to play football and basketball and be engaged with their friends. And now they're confined to their homes. And we as parents and we as a village need to find opportunities for those two kids to be able to still get the things they need, but also look at the signs. Because one of the things I always say is, when you make that decision, you can't take it back. And if a child has hope to understand, even us as adults, we have situations, we have storms. We know there is something on the other side. They can't envision that. So it is our job as a village to be able to set up our, our kids to understand that sometimes you're gonna have disappointments, but that's not the end all. Sometimes it's a blessing, you don't know it. They're like, yeah, yeah, but you have to kind of tell your story, be transparent. So my mission, um, um, uh, Calvin does a lot of major um, programs. I love all of his programs. Um, I love children. He loves children. But this one was very personal for me. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, all right, it's time to hit the pavement again. Because I also work with that age group, yeah. boys and girls, and I see it. I see it all the time. Yeah. Uh, Calvin, I wonder if you can share with viewers, um, you know, the, the things that people ought to be on the, on the lookout for, as Stacy said, as, as you said, people don't see this coming. They don't see this coming uh, with young people around them. What are, the, what are the signs that people ought to be on the lookout for? Well, you know, a lot of times we, with boys, we give them things, and, you know, from video games and things like that, where they are quiet. But um, the, the, the piece that I would say is if you have a four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old, right, you must engage them. Mm -hmm. right? This is engaging them, getting them to talk, making sure that you're getting some more information, ask deeper questions, because these kids are, they're very, very smart. Then you empower them, right? You're making sure that what they want to be is in front of them. Give them the best visuals that you can. And then we apply encouragement. It's, it's really that simple in prevention. But a lot of times we wait till it's too late and then it's intervention. Maybe if we were doing these bridges and building the kids this way early on, maybe middle school, they don't do it. Maybe high school, ninth grade, they don't do it. Maybe we cut into that. Mm -hmm. And that is our hope. Yeah, Stacy, we've only got about a minute left, but I, I want to quickly get you to talk about the the key role that people like you and your family have to play in this, uh, given your experience. Yes, well, I work, first of all, I work at a fabulous organization. I love corporate America after 30 years because I knew this was my purpose. 
Mm-hmm. And so I work at Franklin Wright Settlements, Inc. They've been around here for 140 years. Mm-hmm. And so we deal with those children. And I've actually reached out to Calvin a few times. In the summertime, I can kind of get my hands on the kids. I can identify it. And so just providing those resources. But what I say as a village, when I say village, that means all of us, uh, whatever our profession is, is to recognize. I just sent a kid to Calvin yesterday because he had this outlet, is when you see something, do something. Be the voice. I am not a social worker, but my amazing supervisor is. Um, It's Mark. She is a counselor. So when I see those things, I bring her in. She's a social worker. She can talk to that child. But even you, myself, whatever, if I see it, I at least have a conversation, make a connection, make it a safe space to get them help. Because I'm not the person that's in that field to provide the actual um, therapy, but I can recognize it by the symptoms. So be aware of anybody that's pulling away. Um, they're, they're not eating. They're not bathing. They don't want to play with their friends at that age. Um, be aware of bullying. I do not encourage, and I did not do it for my children. Um, social media has had a major impact on this because they're now being bullied through social media. Yeah. And so um, I would just say, just be that listening ear and be that caring person. And if you don't know how to connect, then you reach out to Calvin at Emmy world.com and we will find the resources for those children. The Detroit Phoenix Center was created to help young people struggling with homelessness. Now the organization is receiving added support as part of the Mary Grove Conservancy's incubator for nonprofits. In addition to getting office and program space on the Mary Grove campus, the group is receiving technical and professional assistance. I spoke with the founder of the Detroit Phoenix Center, Courtney Smith. So let's start with the the Phoenix Center and you telling our viewers what that is and why you started it. Yes. So the Detroit Phoenix Center is a high impact nonprofit organization that provides critical resources, support, and a safe nurturing environment for youth and families in Detroit that are highly mobile and experiencing homelessness or transient. Um, So I started the organization back in 2017. We opened the first and only drop-in center here in the city of Detroit for that population. Um, Just with the rise of youth homelessness in our community, it was critically important for us to be able to respond to that crisis in a unique and innovative fashion. Yeah. Uh, One of the things I think is true about uh, homelessness, but that not everybody, I think, quite understands Mm -hmm. uh, is the fluidity of homelessness, especially in our community. Uh, when we think of homeless people, we think of uh, people we might see, uh, you know, at an overpass or an underpass on the, uh, on the road and people who are chronically without uh, shelter. But families, especially, I feel like are, are subject to a much more changing kind of environment where they might have a place to live now, but they might not have a place to live next week or next month. Uh, and, and that requires a different kind of uh, solution making around, around Yes, that. absolutely. And we primarily serve young people that are experiencing homelessness and youth that are experiencing homelessness ages 13 to 24 look drastically different from chronically adult homelessness. Young people just wanna blend in. They want, they're, they're literally hidden in plain sight. So our um, drop-in center provides that normalcy that they'll be able to drop in, to take a shower, to wash their clothes, to access a um, computer lab, a food pantry, an after-school program, recreational activities, just wraparound supportive services that meet them where they are so that they can graduate from high school, go on to college, and achieve whatever it is that they desire to achieve. And and that uh, that threat to to the, that success that homelessness, uh, that homelessness poses um, is, is really important. I mean, at that critical stage in your life, uh, you need that stability of home. Yes. According to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if a young person doesn't have their basic essentials, it's nearly impossible to focus in school. It's nearly impossible to show up for a job. So we really make sure that we meet those most basic needs and use that as a starting point to provide the other support of services that they will need. So let's talk about the relationship with Mary Grove and the incubator. Yes space. Uh, Mary Grove, of course, is, is in its own mode of transition from uh, a college uh, to a conservancy. Uh, talk about what this uh, incubator program is. 
Yeah, so Detroit Phoenix Center was selected as one of five organizations to participate in um, this incubator that not only provides programmatic space for nonprofits, but we're able to participate in a learning cohort with other organizations so that we can build the capacity of our nonprofit organizations and to continue to support children, youth, and families um, because the impact of COVID has yet to be realized. And we're providing critical resources so so for them to have this wonderful, beautiful campus and say, hey, we want to build the capacity of nonprofit leaders of color to, to help you to go to the next level so that your program is sustainable and to provide you with space um, to be able to do that, it's, it's just definitely an honor to be able to participate in this. And we are so excited and look forward to um, the opportunity to be able to maximize our program. So when Detroit Phoenix Center started in 2017, we launched very quickly. We did what was the fastest, quickest way to be able to provide support to our community. Now we're gonna be able to take a strategic planning approach to be able to build out our ideal space for the young people that we serve. We have access to the dorms that can be used as transitional living. There are other nonprofits on the campus, so we're able to access them as well to provide a wraparound, holistic approach to services so we're not reinventing the wheel, but being able to provide medical, to be able to provide education, to be able to meet the needs of the families if there are physical you know, ailments or sports or choir. It's literally, almost as if there's a village that's being created and every organization that is on the campus is able to tap into that village and to be able to support each other holistically while supporting our unique population. Yeah, um, you know, capacity is one of the things that uh, I talk about a lot when I talk about nonprofits, especially small nonprofits uh, here in Detroit and the, the struggle to build capacity to, to reach that sort of sustainability. Talk a little more about how uh, this incubator program will help Phoenix Center build that kind of capacity. Um, well, we're in a learning cohort. So right now we're being introduced to different speakers and different um, cur a curriculum that's set up. So we have already completed onboarding. So the next step is um, goal setting and then they have we have a session on strategic planning process and then a session on um, formulating strategic partnerships and then also I think what the most impactful part of this is is the peer-to-peer -peer, um, support because oftentimes as a nonprofit founder that started this work relatively young I can often say it feels very um, lonely. <laughs> and so to be able to be a part of a cohort of others who may also feel very lonely can, can really bounce ideas off of each other and to develop programming for the community with in partnership with the community. So the so the incubator helps to build capacity by providing learning opportunities and also providing us with, um, for the first year, we don't have to pay rent. So yeah. part of this is, you know, like equity, which is huge, especially, again, for a small nonprofit organization. And finally today, we have a preview of the documentary, Detroit Jazz City. It explores Detroit's important role in the history of jazz and the people who contributed to this music genre rooted in African-American culture. Take a look. You can't tell the story of jazz in America without also telling the story of jazz from Detroit. There are just too many musicians that have come from here that have made too big an impact. And the list of great musicians from here just goes on and on and on all the way up into the present day. I don't think that Detroit jazz musicians have gotten their due as a group. Until you put all of these musicians together, you don't really realize how profound an impact that the city has had on the course of modern and contemporary jazz. And if you just look at the list of artists and you're a jazz fan, it's like, wow, all these guys are from Detroit? I mean, you can't pick up a record that was made on the East Coast between, say, 1955 and 1970 and not run into one, two, three, sometimes four or more 
uh, musicians that are from Detroit. I would look through the records and find out that, whoa, Donald Byrd is from Detroit. Oh, Tommy Flanagan, the great pianist, is from Detroit. Oh, wow, the Jones brothers, Alvin Jones, Hank Jones, and Thad Jones, and someone like Ron Carter, who is someone who has really been a mentor to me, probably the most recorded bass player in the history of jazz. This is right here from Ferndale. People don't realize the importance of Detroit jazz. You know, of course you've got New Orleans, you've got New York, but then there's Detroit, <laughs> you know? And it's just a little different, you know? It's a little different, the, expe the expectation is higher. When you say that you're from Detroit, they expect you to be a badass. Why is it that this town of all cities would have, because I mean, it's out the way. And why is it that it became the music center, and I was talking to some people today. Actually, I would say that when somebody one of these days sit down and write the history, they will find out that this town has produced more talent and musicians than any other city in America on a one-to-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. now, when you, you got more people that come out of Detroit that are in the music entertainment field than any place in the world. Uh, jazz is an expression of African-American culture. By 1950, 300,000 or so African Americans are living in Detroit. It's about 16% of the population. You have to remember, Detroit, in the middle of the 20th century, in 1950, were the fifth largest city in the country with 1.85 million people. Afro Americans coming from the South, you know, it was running from the fields. <laughs> oh, this we can work the factory. That's a that's. Oh, that's like heaven, you know. And they're getting a, a study, a paycheck, and the paycheck was, after a while, became uh, really substantial. So this became like uh, one of the first middle classes, you know. It was built from the from the auto industry. Being they had good insurance, good pensions, they couldn't do any wrong. <laughs> The center of black life in Detroit in those days was Paradise Valley. There were scores of restaurants, clubs, hotels, providing opportunities for live music and for musicians to make a living. And, you know, musicians could work here and stay here and thrive here. And those neighborhoods, uh, just walking down the street, you could hear blues and jazz seeping out of windows, this sort of thick haze of blues and swing just kind of would settle on street corners. There was classical music in the community, uh, gospel music in the community. Detroit was a center for all kinds of musical activity. You can't underestimate the way in which this the culture was saturated with music. Jazz is an expression of all of that. These places were significant in that it created a space for the African American community, for musicians, for doctors, for lawyers, for families. This was a place that was ours, something that was near and dear to the hearts of people. It was a domain. The name musicians were working around here. I'm talking about like Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, and, and those, those, they would live in Detroit and would go to New York to record and then come back in and work, work, work the region. The Bluebird is where Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis and others would come to play in the late 1940s, and they'd play with the local talent who kept up with them, in fact, inspired them. And, you know, they brought this energy you can see the Detroit Jazz City documentary on Friday, September 18th at 9.30 p.m. right here on Detroit Public Television. That's going to do it for us today. For more, visit AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, you can connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV.
The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation, Ally, and viewers like you. Thank you.